So now, am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay. So coming to this. Uh, so this concept of menopause, I think all of my dear colleagues who have been uh, practicing endocrinology must have noticed that we are seeing a lot of U-turns. We always see U-turns in medicine. But as far as this topic is concerned, we have uh, seen a lot of U-turns in this practice. So I would so it generates a lot of interest that why it has gone out and why it has coming in again. So I'm not going to do into the details of this terminology because this August gathering is well conversant with us. Suffice it to say that now we are using the term um, not premature menopause, but primary ovarian insufficiency wherever there is amenorrhea before 40. And uh, we know that uh, there is a continuous decline in the ovarian reserve leading into the continuous fall in the production of estrogen as well as progesterone. And there is a significant fall here and that leads to cessation of period and that is menopause. We all know that. Now this is, you can see this is, I can say this is a sort of physiology of decreasing estrogen hormone that we see around the age of 40, but gradually it turns into pathology. And this is what we want to really prevent by practicing this hormone replacement or hormone therapy. And this is uh, something which uh, we can, if we do it in the right way, and there are the six points to be taken care of, then let us see how we can sort of help our young women. So classically, this uh, estrogen therapy was being practiced with the older available estrogen that is CEE, classically, then estradiol valerate, and this is also, it was not very much in practice, but now we are concentrating on this. So initial studies were mostly on CEE and MPA. Now, these were little older hormones, and that is the problem why we it all got into disrepute. But the newer hormones, the newer estrogen, that is 17-beta estradiol and didrogestone, which have now become more common, Unfortunately, there is no big data on the use of these hormones. So let us hope that data comes up and we become more wiser. Yeah. So combination of the 17 beta estradiol and uh, didrogestone, that is the first natural choice because it mimics the physiological hormones. So 17 beta estradiol is the most potent human estrogen. We know that. And this didrogestone, because it has high oral bioavailability and affinity to the receptor, this becomes the natural choice. Now, these are the two basic choices around perimenopause or in women who are young women having premature ovarian insufficiency. We give them in the sequential way where there is a scheduled menstrual bleeding. So 14 days only estrogen and 14 days it is combined with progesterone also in the luteal phase. And there is also a different regimen for all those women who have stopped having period and they do not want a resumption of period. So there we give continuous MHT and up to 90% of such women, they do not report any bleeding. So this is quite convenient to them. Now, this is, we all know that if the woman does not have a uterus for whatever reasons, we can give only estrogen therapy, rather we give. But if a woman has a, his, have a uterus, we have to give progesterone to avoid excessive endometrial hyperplasia and possible turning into malignancy. Now, how to approach such women? That is very important, you see. In premature ovarian insufficiency, we start the therapy because there is absolutely no risk of CA breast. It reduces the CBD risk, also reduces chances of osteoporosis, Alzheimer's disease. Then most important is it reduces the hot flushes, which is quite often very irritating and very problematic to the woman in, of that age. And for this high strength of of estrogens are required because we want to have periods here. 
and this is generally continued till the age of natural menopause that is 50 years but if if a woman has had natural menopause we give in the perimenopausal phase a sequential estrogen and progesterone and we regularize the bleeding with this combination but if the woman has well established and in the post menopause period where menopause is well established we give it in the combined continuous fashion and this generally does not produce any bleeding so this we can reassure the woman that look here this there is unlikely to be a recurrence of bleeding so first thing is which estrogen we have to use now as i was telling you the initial studies were in the form of giant this is CEE, that is, uh, just a minute, this point, uh, yeah. So this uh, conjugated equine estrogen was, was the hormone which was traditionally given in the earlier period and this is obtained from pregnant mares and it causes uh, increased load to the liver because it needs conversion. And this is the reason that it produces a lot of prothrombotic effect because of the first pass mechanism in the liver. And this is responsible for increased thrombogenesis, VT, and stroke. But now, fortunately, we have molecules, these are which is identical to the endogenously produced natural hormone, which is unconjugated and hence rapidly available after ingestion. This produces minimal liver load and therefore less prothrombotic effects. This is obviously absorbed rapidly being soluble and this is chemically and biologically identical to the endogenous human estradiol, hence rapidly available after ingestion, leading to minimal liver load. Now this was about the ethanol estradiol. It increases effects in certain parts of the body like liver and uterus and produces unwanted sound effect. Now why it is so? Let us see. So ethanol estradiol contains more risk than 17 beta estradiol because it uh, it is um, the 17 alpha ethanol as substitution and uh, consequent reduced metabolism of this molecule leads to greatly increased magnitude of effect on um, this vascular thromboembolism and CVD stroke. This EE. So now it is getting much and much into disrepute. And therefore, uh, uh, we are now opting for this, seven, this um, natural estrogen that is estradiol. And why it is so? You see, there is an enzyme which is 17 beta H HSD dehydrogenase. Now, this enzyme is very much present in uterus and liver. And this is because of this hormone, there it is. And this uh, hormone actually inactivates this estradiol and leads to decreased effect on these target tissues if we are giving this directly soluble estrogen. But EE is, it does not get metabolized easily because it does not have that affinity for that enzyme. So it stays for a longer time in uterus and liver. So uterus, if it stays for a longer time, it becomes more important and more helpful as far as contraception is concerned. But in liver, it produces more and more lipoprotein changes and which leads to a prothrombotic state. Similarly, coming for the right progesterone. And right, this progesterone, which is this hydrogesterone uh, that we are talking about and the micronized progesterone, the synthesis starts from wild yam and uh, micronized progesterone, it becomes more effective. But at the same time, if we give light, to light because of the with light technology, we bend the molecule and we generate didrogesterone. And the advantage of didrogesterone, it, it improves the bioavailability and specificity and affinity for progesterone receptor and therefore much less dose of this bio, this progesterone is sufficient for producing the effect. Now, differently, we had been using different progesterone and the classical study WHI was with MPA. And this you can see besides being progesterogenic, it has a lot of androgenic as well as glucocorticoid effect. 
and these were probably responsible for all the adverse effects that we had been seeing and noticing and getting afraid of in WHI study. Now, didrogestrone, it does not have any, any androgenic property and neither it has any gluco glucocorticoid-like activity. And therefore, we have a choice. Um, this is the molecule of choice for us. And this is what we have observed that with synthetic progesterone, there is increased risk of CVD, VT, stroke, and breast cancer in comparison to natural digestron and micronized progesterone. And this is what I was talking that this very much because of the increased bioavailability of digestron, we need much lesser dose, that is 10 to 20 times lesser dose of this molecule. So we get lesser side effects and lesser thrombogenic effect if we are using this molecule. So what was the controversy? You see WHI, WHI study, which came in, I think, 2002. So this was the most important villain that we had. And the HRT got a jolt in its, uh, in its uh, progress. And most of the physicians and gynecologists, they stopped using it. And still, they are, we are all very much afraid of it. More so, the physicians, the, the patients also are very, very much afraid of it. So the moment you say hormone, they will just jump out of the chair that it will produce breast cancer and heart attack. But actually, now what we are seeing is that it is not really so. And what was the reason for the failure of WHI study? that uh, the age was more and it was started after much longer period of menopause and most women, 26% of women had prior HRTU and only CEE and MPA have been studied in this study. And it was uh, observed in 2017 that there was probably a bias against this uh, and there was conflict between the investigators and then it was misinterpreted in the lay press and people get afraid of it. And the further results were not really analyzed well. And the younger women, estrogen only HRT, were not picked up for the proper analysis. And they say that they, uh, the problems with this HRT was the average age was much more. More than 66% population was more than 60 years of age. And 16% had already had a family history of breast cancer. 50% were smoker. Many of them were hypertensive, had CVD, history of CVD. And a very large percent of population were obese. So this was basically a high-risk population in which the patients of WHI HI were studied. And basically, this study of WHI was uh, this this objective of uh, this WHI study was not to treat the patient because these patients were asymptomatic basically except for hot flushes. And then there was wrong choice of HRT. Hormones used were equine origin and the progesterone was synthetic progesterone. Till 1994, these molecules were not available in USA. So the, the physicians probably had less experience with the, these two molecules. Then risk of CF Breast is primarily associated with the use of a synthetic drone, which was neglected. So, extrapolation of this WHI result data in the target population for MHT is considered now inappropriate, and MHT should be introduced in perimenopause or early postmenopause within 10 years of menopause, and definitely the, the woman's age should be less than 60 years of age. So post-WHI study, the MPA turned from hero to zero. Now, we studied uh, MPA in the WHI study, and that led to fiasco. So there is a general consensus today that the poor cardiovascular and breast result of the E and P plus arm for WHI were not a class effect of progesterone, but the result of the specific metabolic effect of the metoxyprogesterone acetate, which was studied here. This MPA acts as a potent agonist of the progesterone, androgen, and glucocorticoid receptor that we have just seen. MPA does not bind to the estrogen receptor, but acts as an anti-estrogen, thus further diluting the beneficial effect of MHT on coronary outcomes. 
Now, this is just in the general population. You can see the um, difference in breast cancer incidence per thousand women aged 50 to 59 years. So you can see here if there is a population receiving estrogen only, you will find four fewer cases of breast cancer risk. You see, we are talking about breast cancer risk. And this <clears throat> breast cancer risk significantly increases with this simple parameter of obesity and also with alcohol and uh, smoking like that. So if we can control this thing, that is going to be much more beneficial. And estrogen, the data shows, it is beneficial. So risk of breast cancer, with which we are most often afraid of, what, let us see what the guidelines say. Do MHT cause significant risk of See breast? This is Indian menopause society. No, the risk is only small, only 0.1% per annum. What is the North American menopause society say? It's a rare risk of breast cancer. NICE guidelines also say that the risk of breast cancer with little or no change in the risk. And what AACE says that alone, estrogen alone does not initiate or promote breast cancer. This is, so this, this guidelines are, you would appreciate are quite reassuring to us. Now, so does progesterone matters? Yes, primarily it is the synthetic progesterone, which is the villain and that should be, we should be careful about. Now, what we are talking is not synthetic progesterone here. We are talking of didrogesterone. So which progesterone is safer? Risk may be lower with didrogesterone or micronized progesterone. So micronized progesterone may be safer. That is NAMS guideline. And this is also the AAC guideline. So the risk may be lower with didrogesterone or micronized progesterone than with a synthetic progesterone. So what about the choice of progesterone and breast cancer risk? In this Finnish cohort study, we have found out that in this estradiol, if we are giving estradiol and didrogesterone, there is no significant risk. There's only very, very insignificant rise in the risk and this is not significant. On the other hand, if we are using estradiol and MPA or NETA or other progesterone, the risk is significantly high. So we should be afraid of progesterone, synthetic progesterone. Now, this is about the uh, risk of VTE. Is VTE risk is high with MHT? Again, IMS says it is less frequent among Asian, non-obese, less than 60 years of age. NAM says if it is more than 60, the risk is more. DVD risk increases with age and BMI. And again, the same thing here. So which MST is safer? Transdermal estrogen is safer. And um, it is definitely safer than oral. And uh, so the, the risk may be lower with transdermal MHT containing natural progesterone like didrogesterone or micronized progesterone. So how do we approach with it? Right though. So now fortunately we have many combination. If in women who are post-menopause, we can go the, in this continuous combined MHT in which E2 and, sorry, yes, yeah, E2 and didrogesterone are giving in a Continuous fashion every day. One set is exhausted, the other set is started from the next day. And we get a bleeding free period in about 90% of the patient I, I have just described. But in premature ovarian insufficiency and of course in perimenopause, we should be comfortable as well as our patient should be comfortable if we give them a bleeding pattern which is similar to physiological natural natural periods. So right regimen would be the sequential regimen. You see with E plus D, one 10 or two 10 dose schedule, 17 to 91% women achieve regular cyclical bleeding pattern if we are giving it them in the cyclical way. But if we are giving in the continuous way, you can see around 72 80% women, they become period free, so which is very much acceptable to most women. Now, a word about Tibolone, it was not very much uh, appreciated. Symptomatic benefit of Tibolone appear questionable compared to those of combined HRT. So the 
data is hard data is available again, which shares yes, yes, there is chances of weight gain and bloating increase LDL level decrease HDL. More concerning is the uncertainty about tibolone's risk profile, that especially is true. So this is the molecule is available, but you can judge for yourself. Now, as far as lipoprotein protein, uh, lipoprotein pattern is concerned, this combination of E2 and diadrogestone, it is beneficial in all the four parameters you can see. E plus D, it is all decreased here, decreased here, and HDL rises much more than CE and not just tall. So sequential END, so I, we don't have to tell about this uh, increased BMD to this August gathering. We obviously all know that it is very much beneficial for the improvement in the BMD. So what are the recommendations for all guidelines? If it is less than 40, we should and we must consider MST, which is considered mandatory till natural age of menopause between 40 to 50. Yes, benefit exceed, exceed risk between 50 to 60. We have to weigh the benefit and more than 60. Definitely, we have to evaluate the benefits thoroughly. So menopause uh, strikes early. Yeah, in India, in Asian countries, we have a a menopause which is much more earlier. So why to allow our women to suffer with all those problems we all know, including BMD, decreased, uh, decreased uh, sexual drive, and and people are running, having having struggled to work, and obviously the symptom, the hot flushes of which we are most afraid of. So we have to take a balanced approach between MST and CVD risk. And the timing hypothesis is important. If MST begins late, that is 10 years after menopause, the risk of CVD increases, of which we have to be careful. So early initiation of MST reduces the risk of fractures and all-cause mortality. We have all seen MST, if it started less than 10 years of postmenopause and less than 60 years of age, reduces the risk of all cause mortality, CHD, compared with placebo or no treatment at all. So there is 30% reduction in all cause mortality, 48% reduction in CHD risk, and of course it reduces osteoporosis. Now there is a hard data available, and this Cochrane database also suggests that it is good and it is beneficial and it is recommended to consider and start MST, all those women especially, if they are having it. And this data, let me tell you, is quite recent. It is much more after the WHI fiasco. So summarizing the benefits of MST are there in reducing vasomotor, vasomotor symptom, genital urinary symptom, reducing osteoporosis structure, increasing um, improvement in osteoarthritis, reducing CVD risk, reducing type of type 2 diabetes, reducing obesity. Yes, it is reducing obesity. This is not a misprint. Prevents cognitive impairment and reduces neovascular macular lesions, reduces risk of colorectal cancer, reduces risk of endothelial endometrial carcinoma, and improves quality of life. Only thing is, there is risk of these serious events if we are not choosing our patients and our molecules properly and correctly. So, right root, yes. Transdermal estrogen and progesterone are much more effective. They have less risk. And uh, VTE risk, there is less risk, definitely. And CBD benefit are much more. It improves bone health. It is only thing is that oral, where it is readily available, the availability may be a challenge and it is more expensive. So therefore, compliance also becomes poor. Patient will leave. It is not available. It was not available in my town. I could not get it and it was expensive. So the, uh, the pre uh, preparations are now available in our country where we can have this combination. They are readily available for post-menopause women.